I'd like to also introduce the uh, uh, co-authors on, on this presentation. Howard Skinner is here with us. Um, and uh, Catherine Hayhoe and, and, and uh, Ann Stoner, there we go, uh, are climate scientists at Texas Tech University. And they provided, uh, they're helping us with uh, some of the projected climate data that you will be seeing in, in a few minutes. So dairy farms do have some impact on, on climate change. Dairy farms do emit greenhouse gases, as we've been hearing. And of course, the changing climate impacts dairy farms. So we need to look at both of those scenarios, and that's what we plan to do. Uh, we've heard some about this already. Uh, we're in, dairy farms emit uh, methane and nitrous oxide are really the primary contributors to the greenhouse gas problem from dairy farms. There's also CO2 emitted from the combustion of fossil fuels and maybe the use of lime. But in a whole scale, considering the global warming potential, that's pretty small compared to what comes from methane and nitrous oxide. Most of the methane really is coming from enteric uh, rumination in the animal or their natural process. It's pretty hard to uh, reduce it significantly. Some methane, some nitrous oxide also comes from manure handling systems. Most of the nitrous oxide really comes from uh, feed crop production, use of, of fertilizers and manure uh, in the production of feeds. So there are things that we can do to mitigate, to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions coming from our farms. What we're gonna be looking at here today are some alternatives in manure handling, but there are many other things that can be done as far as feeding and handling the animals and so forth. But the point that I'd like to get across today is that there are many interactions occurring throughout the farm. So it does become very difficult to really project and estimate how when you change one thing, you know, there's a ripple effect and you're changing a lot of things throughout the farm and you really have to put all those pieces together. So we really need to take a, a more holistic whole farm evaluation to really look at and, and, and evaluate mitigation strategies. Well, we've heard a lot about climate change. Uh, and I think everybody in this room now is probably pretty convinced that our climate is changing. We have saw uh, some data on that and the projections, you know, keep going up. So more variable weather patterns, generally warmer temperatures, changes in precipitation. And it's not necessarily increases or decreases in precipitation. Different models project different things. It becomes a little unsettled in that one. In general, this area of the country is projected to increase in precipitation over the next uh, few decades to the end of the century. We'll be looking at some numbers. What does this mean? I guess this is something that was put together by the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, this is just the, the graph here on, on uh, what you're left, kind of projects what New York's weather may look like in the future as we move throughout the rest of the century. So what this is indicating in the lighter orangish gold color uh, is a more moderate emissions project projection through the rest of the century. So the climate in this area might look like the climate in Virginia, you know, the past 30, 40 years, something like that. And the more uh, drastic, uh, projection here is if we just continue to emit uh, emissions at the, at the current rate, as we saw, which was an RCP of 8.5 for those who were paying attention, uh, this is where you'd end up, more like North, South Carolina or Georgia by the end of the century. But there's much uncertainty on this, and we saw that this morning. Models are uh, very all over the place, but generally agree in the upward trend. So our climate is changing. And there's very strong scientific evidence, and we saw that this morning, that most of this change is related to human intervention. I think we saw this slide this morning with the increase in CO2, and this is, one of, this is really the main driver uh, behind climate change at this point. And we are going up by one or two parts per million in our concentration of CO2 uh, each uh, year. Uh, and I think we just broke 400 uh, this past year, something like that. Methane uh, concentrations are also going up. You see there is some leveling here in the early part of the century, and now we're back up on uh, an upward trend. 
Is this because we're putting more cattle on the planet? I don't think so. I doubt it that cattle really have a whole lot to do with that. They're, they're part of it, but, uh, well, natural gas is methane, and we're using more natural gas and fracking and all this that's going on now. There's a lot of leakage, and that may have more to do with that current upward trend than anything else. Climate uh, change impacts many things on a dairy farm, and I guess the most common thing that we think about is crop production, and that's a major issue. So it does affect the yields and quality of the crop, but it affects a lot of other things too. Time minutes of field operations, harvest losses, ultimately the feed quantity and quality available to the animals, um, the stress on the animals. We heard some about that, uh, heat stress. Both temperature and humidity play a, a factor in that. That affects their performance, how much milk they're gonna produce. It also affects their nutrient requirements. It also, uh, all these changes, greater precipitation as we'll see, more intense storms, uh, higher temperatures, all driving greater emissions of uh, nutrients to the environment. So we uh, need to think, put even more emphasis on mitigation as we look at climate change in the future. And all these things, of course, affect the production costs and the overall profitability of the farms. So whether we're looking at mitigation or adaptation to climate change, we need to take this grand whole farm perspective. Uh, when we try to look at individual components, we can easily get into trouble. So our tool for doing this is the integrated farm system model. Uh, this is a model that's been under development for a number of years, and it's used for all different types of, of dairy farms and beef and, and even crop farms uh, across the country. This, far, this model is pretty unique, uh, I think, among any other models in the world in that how process-based it is in all the major components of the farm, as illustrated here. Many other models kind of focus on one or two components. Uh, we try to link everything together on a similar, similar level of detail. So we're, we're simulating the, the crop growth and development as driven by climate, as soil type and other things. Uh, the harvest process, again, as driven by climate and the machinery available and other things. Storage, ultimately we feed the animals, we predict how much milk they're gonna produce based upon how the nutrition that they're receiving from the crops produced. We also predict how much manure they're gonna produce and the nutrient content of that manure. We track it on through the system, looking at the nutrient losses as we return that manure back to the soil and so forth. So we normally do like a 25 year simulation to look at um, sort of long-term projections on the performance the economics of the farm, as we simulate the performance, we can do an economic analysis, and we're looking at the environmental impact of the farm. So this is a list of the different environmental impacts that we can include in the model. What I'm gonna be talking about today is mostly focused on nitrogen losses, both as ammonia, denitrification losses, leaching event, and even runoff. And we're gonna look at the phosphorus loss and how that's impacted, and of course, greenhouse gas emissions. And we'll be looking at the carbon energy, water, and reactive nitrogen footprints. Now by footprint, I think we've heard that term today be earlier. This is the, the, the total emission or energy input, whichever you're working with, expressed per unit of milk produced in, in uh, our analysis here. To do that, we need to use a life cycle assessment. So very quickly, and, and I think Dr. Tolman is going to be talking more about life cycle assessment, I guess, tomorrow or ten, this afternoon, uh, if you're interested in getting more details. But we, look, we need to, of course, look at the direct emissions or the direct energy inputs across the farm boundaries. But we also need to uh, look at the, what we call the pre-chain or upstream uh, emissions or inputs. You know, these are what goes into or comes out of producing the fuel, electricity, fertilizer, machinery, uh, any animals that are brought onto the farm, we have to consider all their footprint basically before they come on the farm, put that all together along with the direct farm emissions or inputs. And then we have to allocate any uh, emissions or resource inputs or whatever to any um, co-products leaving the farm. In the case of dairy, 
this is the animals that are being used for beef. So we have to allocate a portion off that. When we do that, we come up with a total value, divide that by, in this case, the amount of milk produced, and we've got our footprint. So our objective at this point now is to show you a typical, I guess, New York dairy farm. And we're going to evaluate different manure handling strategies and look at how they impact the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental issues as well as profitability of the farm. And then we're going to turn that around and we're going to look at climate change in the future and how that would impact that dairy farm and what adaptations are needed to uh, keep that farm sustainable. So the dairy farm we're working with, um, it's uh, the names uh, a dairy farm for those that are fami familiar with the National Air Emissions Monitoring Study. So I'd say it's probably one of the most well-evaluated dairy farms in New York, if not the Northeast. Uh, we've been working with that for a number of years now. But uh, the farm, as it's described here, was as it was in actually 2009, I guess. But the herd, 1,260 cows, plus the replacement animals being produced on the farm. You see the milk production level, there's 2,400 acres um, that are producing essentially all the, the feed for the farm except for protein and mineral supplements that are being purchased. Uh, so we have alfalfa corn, both silage and, and grain. Uh, wheat, grain that's being sold as a cash crop, but straw is being fed and used for bedding. And we have some grass. The manure handling uh, practices on this farm are, uh, includes anaerobic digestion, liquid solid separation, rapid incorporation of the manure uh, liquid once it's applied to the field, and they are exporting about 12% of the manure solids off the farm. And we're simulating this farm again over 25 years of weather for this area, upper uh, New York. So we've done a lot of evaluation comparing actual farm reported data to uh, simulated. This is just one illustration here that I thought it'd stick in to show that we are ver trying to verify that this model really does represent this farm. So this is simulated versus reported uh, feed production and use. So you can see they match quite well. So we're going to first look at four different mitigation strategies and how they compare. Uh, we're going to start with a slurry storage surface application, no-till system with no manure incorporation. The second one will be liquid solid separation, recycling of the solids for bedding, uh, open storage, rapid incorporation of stored liquid, uh, of the stored liquid followed by surface application. Um, for the third one, it'll be the same as the second, except we are now going to enclose that manure storage and we're going to burn any methane produced in a flare to convert it back to CO2, which, as we saw, reduces the global warming potential substantially from 25 units down to one unit. And finally, then, we're really going to use the system that's actually on the farm. The anaerobic digester is going to be included. We're going to use some of that gas to heat water and, the, and some of it to generate electricity that's used on the farm. So this is a look at the greenhouse gas emissions predicted for this farm. This is under recent historical weather. So you can see the greenhouse gases uh, are decreasing as we move through our four options here. Particularly when we enclose that manure storage, we're almost eliminating uh, the emissions, both methane and nitrous oxide, from the storage. Uh, when we go to the anaerobic digester, that number is increasing a little bit because of increased leakage of the more methane that's being produced. But since we are using the energy produced through that digester, our secondary or upstream component here is reducing. And we can look at this in terms of carbon footprint. It's basically about the same numbers here, but now we've convert, uh, com uh, divided by the amount of milk produced. So we're moving from about 0.95 here, pounds of CO2 equivalent per pound of milk, and we're dropping it down about 20% with either of these systems. If we look at the energy footprint, it's relatively 
flat across here. We're not making much change until we get to the anaerobic digester because, of course, if you're generating energy and using that on the farm, you can reduce the energy footprint of the milk produced by about 30%. We look at phosphorus loss. Uh, it's actually increasing a little because we're going from a no-till system to a system that is tilling and incorporating the manure. So we're increasing uh, primarily sediment-bound phosphorus, not so much the dissolved phosphorus. We may actually be reducing that slightly. This is a look at nitrogen loss. The total, the light blue shows ammonia volatilization. The mid here is denitrification loss uh, as N2O, also as N2 and NO. So there's, there are major, different components there, but a lot of it is N2O. And then the, the darkest blue is that that's being lost through leaching. So you can see as we move through our options here, we are reducing um, the ammonia emission, particularly with this enclosed manure storage. We're basically uh, eliminating any ammonia from the manure storage. However, when we put, since we have, we're keeping more of the nitrogen in the manure, we put that on the field where it's really not being used in this case. Uh, and we're increasing our leaching loss. So we have to be careful about that. Again, we have to look at the whole farm system. So we have to be more efficient in how we use that saved nitrogen to really capture the maximum benefit, which I have not simulated in this case. Uh, when we go to the anaerobic digester, the anaerobic digester is actually breaking down some of the organic N and, and converting to more ammonium. So once it leaves the digester and moves into a pond, holding pond for a while, uh, digestate will lose more ammonia. This is a look at the profitability of the farm. So not large differences across there, but you can see with the enclosed storage, that's the least economical because you're making a pretty big investment in that system and really the producer's not getting anything back for it except his satisfaction of his part in improving the environment. So somebody has to pay for that. Um, in this case, the producer is. When we go to the anaerobic digester then, we're getting a lot of the same environmental benefits and we're getting the energy back into the farm, which again is making it at least similar in profitability to some of the other options. Risk here is the variation among, we're simulating like 25 years, as I said, and this is the variation in profitability across those 25 years. Not a lot of very, not much change across there, but at least you can see with the anaerobic digester, it hasn't gotten any worse, and, it, and in fact has, uh, in a sense, maybe just slightly helped uh, stabilize the uh, variation from year to year among years. So now we're going to move towards looking at climate's impact, climate change's impact on the, this farm. So we're looking at the same exact farm now. And we're looking at, we're including here in this simulation both increased atmospheric CO2 as well as the changing weather patterns. Now the CO2, as we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in a sense, this is sort of carbon fertilizer for plants. So it will stimulate plant growth, particularly for forage crops, as you'll be seeing. So that's all part of what we're doing here. Now, if we m just change these without making any adaptation of the farm, things do not look good. So as we've heard earlier today, I mean, we have to adapt the farm. I haven't done a lot here, but what I have done is adjusted some of the planting and harvesting dates. I've used a longer season corn variety. We're changing four-cut alfalfa system to five cuttings to make use of the lower, longer growing season. So some fairly simple adaptations like that are built into the numbers I'm going to be showing you. In this case, we're using one climate model, and we are in the process of using, getting data now and using more climate models. Uh, as we saw earlier today, different climate models project different things. So. You have to keep that in mind. This is one model. Uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research Coupled Climate System Model Version 4. We're simulating two scenarios. 
RCP 8.5 and 4.5, and you were well educated this morning on what that means, right? So 8.5 is current trend. 4.5 is making pretty good adjustment and leveling off our emissions uh, from here on out throughout the century. Not impossible, but pretty idealistic on what we could do there. So the climate models uh, are generating uh, uh, the climate data uh, under these scenarios, and then we're uh, downscaling that to the specific location of this farm. And again, we heard some about downscaling earlier today, so you know what that means. Uh, and we're calibrating that downscaling using historical climate data uh, for this location. So again, my uh, collaborators at Texas Tech have been really key in all of this. So what does this particular model show? Uh, it's not too much different than some of the numbers we heard earlier today. Uh, this is the temperature, and I guess the, the lighter color here is current temperature for spring, summer, fall, and winter. The darkest color is if we stay on our current trend throughout the rest of the century. And then the medium color here is the RCP 4.5, if we can do some adjustment. But what you see here is about a 10 degree increase in the average temperature throughout the summer months. Uh, if this is by the end of the century following this trend. Uh, similar increases really throughout all the seasons. And if we can do a good job of curbing uh, our emissions, our burning of fossil fuels, you can see we can basically about cut that in half. This is a look at the, what the, this model is projecting for precipitation. Most of the increase in precipitation is projected to occur in the spring and winter uh, months, and I think that, that agrees with what we heard earlier today. In this case, by the end of the century, for some reason, this model is projecting a pretty big increase in the summer, but if at the RCP 4.5, it's not. Can't explain that, that's just what the model's predicting. Again, we're working with one model here. When we get more models incorporated into this analysis, the numbers will change some. How does that affect crop yields? In general, it benefits for each product production. You can see a little increased trend here for alfalfa and corn silage. It's basically decreasing corn grain yields. You can see both in corn grain and wheat, uh, there, there are some de decreases through uh, basically the warmer temperatures at critical times in the summer uh, that tend to drive uh, down grain production but the longer growing season generally benefits forage production. So if we look at feed production for this farm across these scenarios, we don't see a lot of change, actually. Uh, in general, we're getting more forage production, less grain production, but it, as we produce more forage, particularly more corn silage, we only need and use so much corn silage, so once we fill the silo, the rest goes to corn grain. So in this case, that's contributing, offsetting the decreased yield in corn grain, so we can kind of maintain about the same level of grain production. So all these systems clear through to the end of the century with the adaptations we have suggested can meet the nutrient needs of this herd. If we look at profitability, this is also encouraging. Uh, basically, it looks like we're doing all right. Um, with these adjustments, the farm can adapt and it can, be, it can remain profitable. The one that, that may become most questionable is when we go to this high level of emission throughout the rest of the century. It's getting to the point where we are experiencing some heat stress on the animals, less production, and, and things are tend, starting to drop off. If we look at the risk, again, there's not a lot of difference, but when we move out to this 8.5 scenario, high emissions, the rest of the century, late in the century, our riskiness, our year-to-year -year variation in profitability is increasing quite a bit. So even though we might maintain profitability, the year-to-year -year variation is becoming greater. Carbon footprint, there's just a slight increase with the change in climate, nothing substantial. Energy footprint also stays fairly flat, so with the current assumptions system that we're using for this farm, 
uh, we can keep it fairly flat. Uh, runoff losses, particularly phosphorus, as shown here, are projected to increase somewhat dramatically. And this is from uh, more intense storms, basically, greater runoff. So it's affecting both soluble dissolved phosphorus as well as sediment-bound phosphorus. So again, as we look to the future then, some of our current issues become even bigger issues and we need to look at the use of say, cover crops. Another thing that I have not assumed here would be double cropping. And as with, with the longer growing season, that might become much more feasible in this area of the country. So some of these kind of things may and will offset some of what we're projecting right now. So look at nitrogen loss. In general, again, the, the volatile loss is increasing, again, mostly because of the higher temperature, uh, just driving more ammonia emission off of the farms, uh, off the manure, in the barn, storage, and so forth. Overall water footprint for this farm it really isn't changing much. Again, with the increased precipitation and so forth, we're able to maintain production with about the same amount of water. So in summary, uh, forage growth may benefit from projected climate change, I put as long as adequate water is available to meet crop needs, and that seems to be the case in what's being projected for this area of the country. We're also working with other areas of the United States, including California and Texas, where this may not be true and it can have a drastic impact on the overall performance of the farm. So higher temperatures, changes in precipitation patterns will also increase the gas emissions and nutrient losses from the farms, as we saw. So mitigation is becoming even more important. But I guess the most optimistic thing here, particularly for the Northeast, is that we feel that we can adapt pretty easily and maybe even improve our systems, improve profitability as we uh, change, as we move towards this climate change. So my overall conclusion right now, I guess, would be that, that farm and climate simulation models do provide valuable information for both mitigating emissions and, and, and looking at how we can do a better job of reducing our emissions from dairy farms, as well as projecting into the future and looking how we can best adapt our farms to the change in climate. Thank you.